Tonight we're in Portsmouth, a city that's built warships for 500 years and last week was told shipbuilding would end with the loss of almost a thousand jobs. Welcome to Question Time. A welcome to you at home, a welcome to our audience here. We're going to be putting the questions and to our panel who don't know what those questions will be until they're put. From the Cabinet, the Liberal Democrat Energy Secretary, Ed Davey, Labour's Shadow Competition Minister, Stella Creasy, Margaret Thatcher's former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Nigel Lawson, the leader of the GMB, the main union in the shipyards, Paul Kenny, and from is Susie Trucks, the first woman to run a UK truck company, Nikki King. <laughs> so we have, we have, in effect, three generations of politicians here for you to tax with your questions. We take a question from Mark Green, please, first. Was Portsmouth Dockyard sacrificed to keep Scotland in the UK? Was the dockyard sacrificed... Did anybody else have views on this before I come to the panel? You say yes. Yeah. I, I think it's a terrible decision for, for Portsmouth and for Britain and a really bad one for the Navy. If Scotland is independent, where will they build their ships? They won't be able to build them anywhere else and the Royal Navy will have to go and buy foreign ships. A terrible decision. OK. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, the woman here in the, in the second row. Um, just in response to that, being a Scot myself and living in Portsmouth and worried about the impact of the shipbuilding stopping, you need to realise there are an awful lot of Scottish people who do not want independence, and chances are it won't happen. OK. And, and you say over there. I mean, yes. Well, what, what, uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to discuss is uh, if... Uh, BAE themselves, which were the, uh, the main contractor, took over Voss for Thornycroft and then moved for Thornycroft to Portsmouth. What was their plan in the, for the future to go up to Scotland where they have really little shipbuilding experience in small ships? Right, OK. And, and you, sir, there with the beard. Yes. Um, I hate to say it in Portsmouth, but shipbuilders don't have a job for life by divine right. This is all about the government ordering or not ordering ships for the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy, we are still an island nation, remember. We still import 95% of our food, fuel, oil uh, daily by sea. The decision has been made to dramatically reduce the size of the Royal Navy. That's why you guys haven't got any jobs. You can't be expected to have a job for life all the time you've got a government decimating the size of the Royal Navy. OK. A plea for the Navy. <laughs> all right. Um, I'll just go back to Mark Green's original question. Was Portsmouth Dockyard sacrificed to keep Scotland in the UK? As we know, the work is going to Scotland. Um, Ed Davey. It's very difficult when there are people who have lost their jobs uh, families who are worried, the knock-on impact, because it's not just a thousand skilled workers who will be losing their jobs, but the knock-on uh, jobs connected to that. And that's extraordinarily difficult. But it isn't to do with the Scottish uh, referendum. There are some difficult decisions in shipbuilding uh, and for Navy shipbuilding. Um, let's remember there are 800 jobs being lost in the Scottish shipyards as well. Um, what we've got to do as a government, though, is to do as much as we possibly can to help the people who've lost their jobs and to help the economy here in Portsmouth. That's why we're going to invest £100 million in the harbour so that when the uh, aircraft carriers come here, they can be based here and we can have those jobs. And this can be the, continue to be the home, the proud home of the Royal Navy. And then we need to do more. That's why there's a city deal being struck with Portsmouth and Southampton to unlock land that the MODs had, the Ministry of Defence had, so more business can be created in the future, more homes can be built, because they're needed too. So we are going to try to do as much as we can uh, do, but, um, you know, I'm clear, this is a difficult decision, uh, and it's not going to be uh, easy for Portsmouth, but we are going as a government to be there to help Portsmouth. When your, when your Defence Secretary said he didn't anticipate the UK would wish to place orders for warships outside the UK, and it's something people in Scotland need to think about very carefully. Was that not a threat 
about removing these build this building from Scotland and returning it to Portsmouth if Scotland votes for independence? As I understand if it, not, what did I, it mean? I understand it's a legal requirement because if the ships were being built in an independent Scotland, the tender would have to be across the whole of the European Union. Um, the European rules say that you can have a defence tender in your own country because of security defence in, uh, interests, but as soon as those ships are being built outside, you have to offer it to all the defence industry across the European all Union. Right, so the so threat he was stating, is real? He, he, well, it, and he was stating a legal fact. All right. Paul Kenny. Well, um, I mean, I think we just need a dose of reality here. Um, in, the last, uh, in the last few days, in the last week, we've seen about 10,000 jobs go out of our economy. And uh, the jobs at Portsmouth and in Scotland are part of that pattern. And I want to say this about it. You cannot turn on and off highly skilled jobs about building ships to protect an island nation. And frankly, and I pick up the point that was made by the gentleman from the audience in particular, we have decimated the Royal Navy. We have decimated it. We now have an entire surface fleet of 18 ships. We couldn't fight a cod war, let alone go around the world and actually protect the interests. We couldn't throw an exclusion zone around the Isle of Wight. The reality is that we've run our Navy into the ground. 1,000 highly skilled jobs from Portsmouth. On the back of, in this area, by the way, another 300 at Polly Mary, another, another uh, factory down the road. Absolutely decimating this area. But I want to say this, because I listened carefully to what Ed said, and I'm going to pick him up on it. You see, 18 months ago, our union pleaded, begged, begged almost the government not to give a contract for £500 million of shipbuilding work to Korea. These are ships, four ships, that service the Royal Navy when they're at sea. Four ships. And the government, and the minister at the time wasn't you, Ed, it was actually Philip Hammond, who gave that contract to Korea. And all they had to do was to designate those ships as warlike. If you like, put a catapult on the front, which something one of the French might have done to protect their own shipbuilding, and we should be at the front of the. Why, why were they sent to Korea on money basis? Because they, <coughs> well, they, they said curiously they, that no British company finally bid for the. No, those because jobs. because they weren't effectively any bids from British companies because they were told it's going to Korea. That's the reality of it. Whereas if they had been deemed as as warlike because they service Royal Mail, uh, Royal Mail, they might, may do that as well. The way we're going, but. <laughs> the Royal Navy, the truth of the matter is, then right. that would have been work that would have fitted into these yards and would have kept those jobs both here and in Scotland. So this is not a battle between Portsmouth and Scotland because a lot of people in Scotland are going to lose their jobs. This is about proper support for the Royal Navy and getting jobs that can be put, keeping skills in this country, keep them here. You could have kept those, those ships in the UK, but in the same way Mr Hammond sent rail carriages to Germany instead of giving them to Derby. He sent those four ships to Korea instead of keeping All British right. skilled workers in British yards and keeping our Royal Navy afloat. Okay. Uh, Ed Davey, I'll come back to you a bit later on those points, but you, sir, on the left. Yes, there. I run a small shipbuilding yard in Portsmouth. We're very small. We're very proud of our export record. We don't borrow any money. The government's never helped us. Our landlord has now told us the site is being redeveloped. We've got to move. Where's all this land going to come from? You've hit the nail on the head, sir, when you said, and houses will be built there. We can't, we can't find premises because all the waterside industrial premises go for housing. De designer housings that nobody can afford to live in. This is despite the fact the government have announced today they're releasing well, LOD I, land. Yeah. I, I can... await to see that. Right. Every well, time. Attention. Hold on a second, Ed. Let me, let me just go round the, round the table. Nigel Lawson. I feel sentimentally very strongly about what's happening to the Navy and to Portsmouth in particular. When I joined the Navy in the mid-50s as a national serviceman, I joined as an ordinary seaman at the Victoria Barracks in South Sea, just down the road from here. Uh, I don't think it exists anymore. And then uh, eventually I ended my time, very luckily, as the commander of a motor torpedo boat, the Gay Charger, 
the word meant something different in those days, um, based uh, in Gosport. So I know this area well and I know the Navy well and I feel for it. And the, it is true that what has happened is that we have been engaged as a country in two land wars, which I don't think are going to bring us any benefit, either first in Iraq and now in Afghanistan. And this has meant a preponderance of defence spending overwhelmingly on the army, and the Navy has suffered as a result. We need a strong Navy. It's vital that we have a strong Navy, in my judgment. Fortunately, Portsmouth is going to continue to be the premier naval base for the surface fleet in this country. The two carriers are going to be here and uh, a whole lot of other work is going to be here. A whole lot of ship repairing is going to be done here. So uh, Portsmouth is still going to be tremendously important for the Royal Navy and for the nation. But Nigel, you're, you're, a, you're a, um, a shrewd old political bird. I've been around the block several times, if that's what birds do. Um, do you think the decision was... BAE on commercial grounds, or do you think the government lent on them because of it going to Scotland rather than Portsmouth? People are bound to have that suspicion, mm. and I understand that completely. I believe it was BAE on commercial grounds. There was, I think that many people, people in the know, uh, saw this coming a long time ago, uh, because there wasn't going to be enough work for, for, for two right. great ship uh, shipbuilding yards, and uh, it was clear that BAE wanted to, to have the Clyde. All right, thank you. That, the man up there with the, on the right, yes. Um, I'd just like to say that um, you're talking about throwing money into Portsmouth and this is going to happen, that's going to happen. What about the skilled workers? What's going to happen to them when they lose <laughs> their jobs? What have you put aside <coughs> for those men yeah. and the ladies? Stella Creasy. I think so. You've, you've hit the nail absolutely on the head. I've been talking to people today from Portsmouth about the impact of this. People desperately, desperately worried, uh, as Paul says, not just about losing the jobs at the shipyard, but some of the other redundancies that are being talked about in this local community 40 days before Christmas. For a lot of families thinking about possibly losing a job or facing redundancy within a matter of weeks, it's deeply, deeply worrying and frightening. And yet, as Nigel says, people in the know knew for a while that this was a possibility. I think Portsmouth understands that contracts come and go. It's the planning, it's the organisation to make sure that we hold on to those skills so that we can actually retain a sovereign capacity to build ships. And that's what I find so worrying and so troubling about this incident, is that we don't know what those plans are. We haven't necessarily seen the detail, the guarantee that we'll maintain that sovereign capacity and that we're thinking about how to maintain those skills because that's what makes Portsmouth such a fantastic place to build ships and that's what we've got to retain, whatever the future holds for Portsmouth. All right. The, the woman on the, on the gangway there. And keep your hands up if you want to speak. Don't put them down again because I'll miss you. Yes. I just want to know, really, how, if this decision has been made or if this decision has been anticipated for a year, mm then why, with all the plans that were mooted about how to keep shipbuilding in Portsmouth, why nothing has actually been done to do that? Ed Davey? Well, um, uh, quite a lot's been done, but the, the, one of the issues when you look at this is it does go back an awful long time. Uh, the Maritime Industrial Strategy that the last government published in 2005 anticipated that after this bu big bulge of building the aircraft carriers, uh, aircraft carriers there would be consolidation. Um, now, BAE had to make that decision. It is BAE's decision. We're going to do as much we, as we can to support Portsmouth. Um, I want to make sure that BAE lives up to its responsibilities too. Now, it's talking now about phasing some of these job losses. <laughs> I think that was in the news today, and I think uh, Paul uh, welcomed that. Um, it's also talking about redeploying some of the skilled workers so they aren't lost uh, to the country. I welcome that too. And I hope BAE does think long term. Uh, and it's got to decide what it does with these assets. Um, I hope it doesn't asset strip them. I hope it looks to see whether or not there can be a buyer for the yards, maybe a commercial shipbuilder of some sort. I don't know, but I hope BAE right. lives up to its responsibilities to Portsmouth. All right, and before I come to Nicky, since uh, the, the question was raised, what about these ships that went to Korea, to South Korea? Why was that decision made when they could have been built in this country? Well, my understanding was the one that you were replying, that uh, no British firm has bidded... Bit in the well, that was what was said. I don't understand it at all, but that's what was said by um, the, the government. Um, Luff, it was. Peter Luff. Yeah. I can confirm a number of UK companies participated in the competition. 
However, none submitted a final bid for the build contract. Well, what does that mean? You must know well, the answer to that. What happened? This, in reality, is what it means, is that the government could have deemed this work, these ships, to be what is termed warlike. But why can't Portsmouth bid for a non-warlike ship? Well, they could have done. But, but you know, I don't well, know... Well, says they never did. I, yeah, but I don't know whether... The idea that, that BAE and the government are two entirely separate entities on all matters is laughable. Um, look, the reality of life... <laughs> the, the reality of life is that had these ships been deemed to be... Uh, they, everybody knew. Somebody in the audience said, well, you must have known there's this huge gap. And of course they did. And if they didn't, we pointed it out to them. These ships were available. They could have been deemed warlike. They serviced Royal Na the Royal Navy. Had they been deemed warlike, the government would not have had a problem about competition. It could have put them into these yards or in Scotland and kept the continuity of skills. Yeah, but it chose to put it out to open yeah, competition. And then, lo and behold, no British shipyard But, but this is because the, the British ship... Yards knew they would be more expensive and wouldn't get well, who, well, accepted. Is that between what it is? you and I? Who knows? Well, if you'd been in, if you'd been bidding, you'd who have knows? Been, would, does anybody know the answer to this here? What? Yes. Well, well, I, I think he's. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't oh. remember your name, Paul. Well, I think he's uh, he's he's uh, talking with his tongue in cheek here because. There's no British shipbuilder can compete with the the Koreans or the uh, on Japanese. Price. Or, there, no, on price. price or time. All right. The, I mean, I've, I've been, have experience of, of building ships for the MOD, and I know the, the cost overrun is horrendous. It's not... We don't talk about thousands, we talk about millions. Well, so nobody bid because they knew they wouldn't get in for I the don't chance. Think but this was a thing about maintaining, maintaining no, no. skills in this country oh. to build a fleet. It's not you shaking no. your head. No, no. They <laughs> are tactical decisions. Well, then why don't they build the warships in Korea, sir? Pardon? Why don't they build all the warships in Korea? Well, because it's... Uh, it's exactly. A, it's, it's, no, no, I haven't said anything yet. What no, you it's exactly policy. <laughs> it's policy, isn't it? No, no, no. It's, it's, We're it's talking a, about it's thousands a go, it's of skill security. jobs it's for what? British work. It's security, and a warship is secure. Ship. Right. Nikki King. Well, my home base is the Medway Towns, so uh, I'm a Chatham girl, and I remember the devastation in the 70s. It's in, printed in my psyche when they shut Chatham Dockyard in favour of Rosyth. And uh, immediately, unemployment went to 20%, and the whole area has never recovered since. They're still struggling from that. And it also did something to our hearts and our minds, because we were proud to be a dockyard town. We were very proud to have the Navy there, and it took away the incitement of living there and everything else. Now, I know it's not as serious here. I know that there's 1,000 people, which is a huge number of people, but I think 4,000 now I'll still be working in the dockyard. Well, I've got to... I mean, everybody else has said everything, other than I totally agree that at the Royal Navy, it's shameful what we've done to the Royal Navy, and I feel absolutely ashamed that, that we haven't got the vibrant Navy that we used to have. I was so proud of our Royal Navy. And I remember coming here, I think it was here, um, to go on the Art Royal, and just how wonderful it was. But uh, one thing I want to know is, what the hell were the uh, sales department doing at BA? BAE, you know, you, you, they must have known about this three, four years ago. If I'm selling, if I've got a major customer that I'm going to lose within two years, I've got a sales department where we're looking at new things to sell, new ways to go, and going out and finding new clients. They've had plenty of time. There's commercial shipping, there's cruise ships. You know, what on earth were they doing? OK. No. No. They've got lots of... A lot of people with their hands. A lot of people with their hands up. But if you could be quite brief, I'll try and bring in three or four of you. You sit here on on the, on the left here. Yeah, I think Paul um, got it dead right. We do need to maintain the skills, and we're going to lose them. We're an island community. We ha we need ships. Now, I even in the private sector, where do they have them built? Nine out of ten, it's Croatia, it's uh, Philippines, when they can be built here. And the reason they're doing it, of course, labour, etc., makes it cheaper. The railway model we've got here with millions of pounds going into subsidised railways, why can't we build ships here? Yes, it's going to be a bit dearer, but we can subsidise that. The government should subsidise building them here and then put uh, workers in work paying tax as opposed to putting them on welfare like they've done now. Do you, do, you, do you agree with him, uh, or is, I, it, is it finished? I don't agree with that. I'd like to come back to warship building, which is a separate issue. Uh, and I think it is absolutely vital 
that we retain a warship building capacity in the United Kingdom. Uh, whatever else happens to the two other ships, like the ships that were built in Korea, warship building there must be in the United Kingdom. And I think that the lady in the front there is absolutely right. I think it is most unlikely that the Scots will in fact vote to leave the United Kingdom. But if they do, if, and I don't think it's likely, if they do, then whatever Ed, Ed Davey says about European Union rules, forget it. We will have to keep a, ship, a warship building capacity in the United Kingdom, which would inevitably mean here in Port. That's what I was saying. I agree. No, you said you. European Union rules we had, might go anywhere. No, no, right? I, no, I said that European rules would it mean that they would come back to England. So it's right. a good I said I'd, agree I'd, with you. I said I'd hear from some more people. The woman on the right of the gangway there. Uh, yeah, basically, I, I find it disgusting the fact that I worked in the MOD for 11 years myself, and I know this has been on the cards for an awful long time, and what has been done in the area in terms of the industry and backing up the economy in the local area, there's nothing being done, and then suddenly it's like, oh, by the way, Vince Cable was talking about this a year ago. And nothing has been done. And who's done, who's done the nothing, so to speak? <laughs> well, it, it goes back from Blair to now. It's, it's all of them. They've, they've done nothing. There's no, there's no backup plan that's been done to the, protect the economy. Yeah, well, what, what and it's just two things. things. Blair, Blair included. There's two yeah. things I'd say. I mean, uh, the government told us that Michael Fallon's been working on a plan for this area for the last year. I, I just don't see what that's achieved. The second point I would point out is Paul is right when he talks about what governments can do when it, they're clever about procurement, about how they invest in an area, because it's a very short-term strategy. We have had a 200% rise in long-term youth unemployment in Portsmouth since the election. Actually, because the government specifically excluded taking in the wider economic and social factors with its procurement strategy when it came to the Ministry of Defence, some of the decisions that have been made, I think we're now seeing the chickens come home to roost. And there is so a question for me about how do you keep those skills. Are you telling me that if you were in government, you would not have given it to Scotland, knowing how many voters this, you have in Scotland Scotland, to the south a, but south Actually, no, because I think there's a really important point here. I'm not going to pit. I'm not going to pit Scottish workers against Portsmouth workers. Both communities are going to suffer because there's going to be change yeah. in those communities. What I am saying, though, is that when we are seeing long-term youth unemployment of the levels that they've got in Portsmouth, thinking about how you as a government could be creative about your procurement to make sure you keep the skills, keep the skills that are long-term skills that we are going to need, is a smart thing to do. And that's what we've okay. not seen happen here. Y you sit up there. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add some uh, balance to this contention that the Royal Navy is decimated. Uh, you know. The size of the fleet is not ideal, but we currently have ships on patrol in the North and South Atlantic, in the Middle East, and indeed we have an aircraft carrier and a destroyer uh, shortly to deliver aid, uh, deliver aid in the Philippines. Uh, and as we've already alluded to, we have two uh, uh, carriers coming to Portsmouth in the very near future. So th there is a, a good news story there as well, I think. All right. And you say yes. In the, in the... I couldn't agree uh, less. You the couldn't key... agree less. The key point here is that our carriers, our amphibious ships and our Royal Fleet auxiliaries require escorts. Yep. When I joined the Navy in 1965, we had 109 frigates and destroyers. And as you've heard, we've now got 19. We have been decimated. Ed Davey. Well, um... <laughs> got point. Interesting fact. When the aircraft carriers come to Portsmouth, and this is their home, the Royal Navy's base, when the T-45s come, there will be more tonnage of Royal Navy ships in Portsmouth than since the early 1960s. That is good news for people working in the, in the Royal Navy base. There's going to be a lot of work done to make sure those ships can be there. £100 million of investment to serve that very big large of tonnage with these modern, modern ships. But I also want to say, yes, we're going to invest in the dockyard, but the city deal I talked about we estimate it's going to be producing 17,000 jobs as well as nearly 3,000 homes. So that will be good news for this area. I know it may not be some of the skills that are used in the dockyards at the moment, in the shipbuilding yards. That's why it's incumbent on BAE to try to help those people redeploy so those skills can be kept Do you believe this is going to happen? Uh, well, yeah, I, I believe in the tooth fairy sometimes as well. Um, can, I, can I just say, look, it, this scenario that you've been painted, both Ed and, and Nigel, the, you know, the people of Scotland make a decision. I'm not going to comment on it because that belongs to the people of Scotland. It really does. And, but if they took such a decision for independence, you say, well, OK, it'll all be right because all the work will come back here. To what? They'd be gone. 
I mean, there'll be houses built. Where do you think all the, where do you think all those people are going to go? They're going to see thousands of people that are going to make redundant with these unique skills that they're going to sit around for the next two years. All right. Actually, I'm, waiting for you to call them in. All right. I'm, I must just you pick, lose it. We must next move on. But I take a point from you, sir, and a point from you. <laughs> you up there with the spectacles on. The man with the spectacles in the second row from the back. Mr Davey, I believe these uh, aircraft carriers aren't actually coming into service until about 2019, six years' time. How many people are we going to have left in the Navy to man them, as you seem to be decimating them at the moment? Well, we won't, we won't be. We'll not be. The, hun the £100 million pound investment in the infrastructure in the harbour here is coming to help uh, and produce construction jobs. In the meantime, that is going to be not part going to of man the period the ship, between, na between now and them actually being coming into service. That's okay. not going to man the ships. And I take one more point from the man here with the beard in the centre there. The gentleman's point is exactly right. The MOD have already planned when the two carriers arrive in Portsmouth, one of them will go straight into reserve because they do not have the staff or personnel to staff them. OK. I think we should move on. With, uh, obviously, we could, here in Portsmouth, we could do the whole programme on, on the topic of the, the shipbuilding and the docks. It's very important. But uh, anyway, you can comment, as always, from home on these issues, text or Twitter, our hashtag BBCQT. You can follow us at BBC Question Time. You can text comments to 83981 and the red button will tell you what others are saying. I go on to another, another question. This is from Andrew Zeal, please. Andrew Zeal. Does the Royal Marine, recently convicted of murder, deserve any form of le leniency? This is the Royal Marine who was found guilty of murder in Afghanistan. And some military voices have been raised saying that he should be treated leniently. Um, Nikki King, what's your take on that? No. Um, originally, uh, before I actually read the, the report of the case, I talked a lot about the heat of battle and, you know, soldiers are soldiers. But when you actually look at the evidence, uh, it was cold-blooded murder, full stop. And so I don't think there's any question about it that uh, he should be held... Accountable. Nigel Lawson. Nikki is absolutely right. I don't think I've got anything to add. She is absolutely right, and I think this is accepted uh, by the the Royal Marines themselves. Julian Thompson, who, um, as you know, served in the Falklands, said that he um, wasn't going to stand around bad mouthing him. He, I don't condemn him. He's like a member of the family who broke the law. Yeah, but there have been other Royal Marines who have taken a very... What do you think of the Daily Telegraph's petition uh, to have the judge show leniency? Well, it might well be a good journalistic stunt, uh, but uh, it does, doesn't alter my view, which is exactly the same as Nicky's. That murder is murder. Um, Paul well, Kenny. This particular, and this, you know, yeah. there weren't, there, there, were, there weren't circumstances uh, really to change that verdict. It was very, very thoroughly done. It was a proper procedure, and I'm afraid there weren't any mitigating circumstances. The man in the pink shirt there. Do we need to look at what separates the Royal Marines from the Taliban? And one of the major differences between one and the other is that the Royal Marines works in the parameters of the law, and the Taliban does not. Mm. What the Royal Marine in question did with one shot from his pistol is blur the lines between what is right and what the Royal Marines do nine times or even more out of ten, um, and what the Taliban do on a daily basis. Um, are you still here? Um, if it was your son that was at the end of that bullet, how would you feel about that situation? Murder is murder, and there's no justification for it. OK. Does anybody disagree with what the general tenor of views so far? You do, sir, up there. Yes. I'll just turn that question around. What if it was your son who'd been out in Afghanistan for six months and the hell that they, they went through out there, seeing the, their comrades' uh, arms and legs hanging from trees? We don't know the stress that they were under. And I think to condemn him is awful. We, I can't condone it either, we, but we don't know what the stress he was under. And he was sent out there in our name. I'd agree with that if you hadn't read the dialogue yeah. that was that actually dialogue. recorded at the time. Of Paul Kenny. Dialogue. Well, I, there, there is that point about the question about that the incredible stress that we put our armed forces under in the most difficult scenarios that you can imagine. But let's be clear about it. 
You know, there's, you have to have that standard. I mean, how do we hold up a moral line effectively if it, what we do is to execute injured prisoners? Yeah. And if that was, the boot was on the other foot, we rightly would be condemning whoever did that to our personnel. So irrespective of what the opposition is, you don't execute people like that in cold-blooded terms. You just don't do it. Stella Pusey. Um, I think, I think the gentleman who asked the question got it absolutely right. One of the reasons that we ask people to... I mean, we've just had Remembrance Sunday, a hugely, hugely important day for the families of those people who go to serve because we ask them to make the ultimate sacrifice in, in serving potential. And one of the reasons that we do that is to uphold those values and to uphold those freedoms. So actually, we must be consistent about that. And my worry about this case is the potential that it has to stain the good name of so many people. I, I, I speak as somebody who has friends and family who serve, and I'm a proud president of the Royal British Legion in my local community. I feel very passionately the importance of defending the good name of those who go, we go and ask to serve overseas. And so part of the way that we do that is also when those people do transgress in this way, to say that is not acceptable, it is not any different. You're absolutely right, sir. Murder is murder. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go on to another question. Simon Frost. Oh, Ed, I didn't, I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, I'm going to agree with everyone else, yeah. but I do want to make the point. I think it follows on from what Stella was saying. Uh, the Royal Marines have an incredibly proud history. They have done this country some magnificent achievements and uh, I think one of the reasons why we have to see this legal process through, allow the evidence to be judged and the sentencing to, to, to go through, is because of that proud history of the Royal Marines. Um, it, because we do not want the reputation of the Royal Marines besmirched and getting justice done and seen to be done is the best way to uphold that proud tradition of the Royal Marines. All right, I'll take a couple more points. The man there with spectacles. Yeah, you, I was sir. just going to say... Um, Obviously, with this individual case, then it is right that justice is done. But if we're talking about murder is murder, what about the civilians that we killed when we bombed Baghdad and Libya? OK. And you, sir? I'd like to know what the, the panel think, but if this is murder, and I believe it is murder, what do they think about the drone operators that kill hundreds of people every day? The point he was making. And the civilians who are killed. What do, does anybody want to come in on that? I think on, on the, the drones, I, I think there's a serious question that we've got to face up to. Because um, I think if the Americans keep using drones in the way they've been doing, I think everyone's going to say this is uh, uh, setting a very, very dangerous precedent. Uh, and I think the, the UN and I think the international community has got to look very seriously at these weapons, that uh, they are... Uh, potentially, well, they are transgressing uh, sovereignty, and uh, of in, in the, the case that's, uh, that we know about America, the sovereignty of Pakistan. And while their uh, uh, drones can be, if they're not being used uh, as a, in a military way, they can be used for surveillance in a very, uh, very effective way, and that's how the British use them. I think there are some real serious issues on the, uh, the international law of the use of drones, and uh, the American government is beginning to look at that. But I think it needs to be taken but much how more do seriously. You, than it's done the point is, how do you how do you compare? This one Marine killing the injured member of the Taliban, I must assume, with what we know are hundreds of killings of women and children in Afghanistan by drones, in Pakistan by drones, and we just say, well, we ought to look at that. Well, the, the, I'm, there are lots of uh, rules, quite rightly, strict rules on international uh, engagement and conflict. And my concern with drones is that the international law hasn't caught up with them, and it must do, uh, so that people who are using these t types of technology actually n have to abide by the law. The Royal Marines do when the Royal Marines what are in... What do you mean in, by in, abide in, by the law if you're firing because, a drone from... Because, because the, law, the, the law isn't being applied to those. That's the, my point I'm making. The law hasn't caught up with the technology, and I'm calling for it to do that. But until the law catches up, you can use them with impunity, you mean? Well, no, we shouldn't. Um, I, you're and, saying and we, the Americans and do? And, and we don't. Well, um, I don't know enough about how the Americans use them. What I'm saying is, a lot of Americans are saying this, but the Americans in their armed forces are saying, we have got to make sure that we don't set a precedent so other countries start right. doing what we're doing with drones, because well, that would be well, very dangerous. Paul Kenny. Well, I mean, I think the killing of innocent civilians is wrong, and if it's wrong, it's wrong universally, and we should have the courage to say that, and I don't find that a difficult problem. Can I just say, I think, uh, Ed, the, the difficulty here is the drones are getting away from us because now the Americans are working on robo-drones. They don't even have people at the end of these uh, TV screens guiding the things. 
These things are pre-planned when they take off. And their basic mission is pre-planned. It's to kill people. So they don't even have the pro probability of aborting the thing if on the, they look and they see there's lots of civilians there instead of the supposed okay. target. OK, let's, let's, let's move on. Um, Simon Frost, please. Simon Frost. Is Typhoon Haiyan further evidence of mankind creating climate change? And if so, what can we do to reduce the risk of further disasters? Is Typhoon Haiyan further evidence of mankind creating climate change? And if so, what can we do to reduce the risk of further disasters? Nigel Lawson. No, there is no connection at all uh, between this typhoon and, and climate change. If you look at, the, if you look at tropical storms, uh, you will find there has been no increase in the amount or, uh, or the, the strength of tropical storms for the past 100 years. And indeed, this year, there are, typhoon Haiyan is terrible. Absolutely appalling, but these things, I'm afraid, happen in the tropics. In the in the uh, the Atlantic hurricane season, and, uh, this year has been one of the quietest hurricane uh, seasons in the Atlantic within living memory. The the it is. The, the quietest, the least, although they predicted there'd be more, for 30 years or more. And if you look at the, what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says, which is recognised as an authority on this, they say there is absolutely no connection between uh, so-called climate change and uh, tropical storms or tropical uh, of all kinds. This is, I'm afraid, uh, a, a scare which people, which people latch on to, but there is absolutely no scientific uh, merit in it. There is no statistical merit in it. There has been no increase in extreme weather events at all, and this is fact. Um, Ed, Ed David, you agree? Well, I'm, I'm glad to see that Lord Lawson now is uh, praying the IPCC in aid. Uh, he doesn't normally do that. Um, but on the question, um, I think he's actually right that uh, there is no evidence that climate change is increasing the frequency of tropical storms. What there is evidence is it's increasing the uh, impact of the intensity of those storms. And, it's th and this is how it's doing it. Sea levels are rising. Uh, that's a fact, and I hope uh, Nigel Lawson will agree. And that's happening because of climate change, because the ice caps are melting, the glaciers are melting. That means that with higher sea levels, islands like they have in the Philippines uh, archipelago and low-lying coast, coast, uh, coastal areas are far more vulnerable to these storms than they ever used to be. Uh, and that's the real danger of climate change. It isn't always that, the, that it's increasing extreme weather events, although the IPCC says in some cases they think it is, but it's making these, these areas far more vulnerable. And that's why these disasters are on a scale we've never seen before. So we have to take climate change extremely seriously. This country we have to lead by making sure we are taking the measures, whether it's investing in renewables or low carbon energy efficiency. We have to lead in the world. Uh, next week I'm going to the Global Climate Change Talks in Warsaw, we're preparing to sign, hopefully, work to sign a global deal in 2015. The world has got to take action. All the evidence says it's more urgent than ever before. And I hope Nigel, when he looks at the evidence now that's coming out from the IPCC, which is now quoting in favour, doesn't normally, I hope he will now actually realise that the world has to take action on climate change. <laughs> Nikki King, where do you stand on this? Isn't this all so confusing? One minute I'm told I've got to save my rubbish and the next minute I'm told it all goes into the same landfill site. One minute I'm being told that if I don't, we, we don't save the planet, it's going to die in 20 years and somebody else says, no, this is just the natural life of a planet. I wish there was somebody who would tell me exactly what's going on and then I could make a decision. It is so, so difficult. So I find it very confusing. I have to say, you know, I'm in the truck business I think you'll probably agree that the motor industry probably is the industry that has been terrifically uh, done an awful lot for climate change. We're now in the unique position that if one of Sorry, done an awful lot for climate change. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, an awful lot. We've cleaned its own act up some, enormously. Some, some. I mean, we're now in the position that one of my trucks parked in Calcutta, the air coming out of the exhaust pipe will be cleaner than the air going in. But when I look round, if you look round Calcutta, you'll see thousands and thousands of vehicles that are 10 years old, 15 year olds, 20 year olds, pouring God knows what into it. I'm not quite sure what this little Europe can do when there is so much of the rest of the world that needs to come up to speed. Okay.
Still appreciate it. I think, I mean, uh, Nigel, I hope you will take up the offer made by the Filipino delegate to the Climate Change Conference. I don't know if people saw today his impassioned speech um, it made a lot of people cry about his view that there was a connection. I actually take the scientific evidence on that, but let's look at the scientific evidence that shows that there is a 95% chance that climate change is man-made. Now, absolutely, that means there is a 5% chance that it is not, and it's right that we have a public policy debate about how do we deal with that kind of risk ratio. My sense is that 95% is a pretty good standard to start thinking about what we can do to address that because that gentleman was talking about trying to take dead relatives out of the, the rubble of the buildings and trying to deal with the consequences of this. We are not immune to our own responsibilities about the things that we can do to create a more sustainable way of living. And I don't want to take the risk that we might, not, we might be in that 5% when the 95% evidence, and it is independent scientific evidence, Nikki. I'm afraid sometimes when I hear you talk, Nigel, I hear it's where opinion meets fact. And the fact is that climate change is happening. We have to find ways to address it. We can have different debates about how we address it but the idea that we can ignore it that we can somehow make it go away well I say just go and talk to those people in the Philippines I think you'll hear a very different story I think you're very confused if I may say so first of all uh, global the, the where there's no scientific connection uh, and this is accepted by the IPCC and accepted by the great majority of scientists is but is between global warming and the hurricanes and typhoons, including this terrible one in the Philippines, which, of course, is particularly that. bad. Well, that's what the question was about. No, I didn't as say for, that. As for, as for the 95 per cent, the, what they are saying is that they are 95 per cent certain that the amount of global warming that there has been uh, is largely due to carbon emissions. Now, but in fact, there's been very little global warming. There's been none at all over the past 15 See years. What I mean? This is a fact. The, you go to the Met Office, they admit this. Everybody who knows anything about it admits this. The amount of global warming is very little. Ed, now, yeah, Ed, say, I'm I'm sorry, sorry. Ed, Ed what do you wrong. say to that exact point? Every the decade in the last years. three decades, it's been getting warmer. What's happened uh, this over the year, last 15 this year years? This year is going to be the seventh warmest on record. And it's not just global temperatures, it's temperatures in the oceans. And it's not just yeah. temperatures, it's the ice caps that are melting. It's not just the ice caps that are melting, it's the sea levels. It's not just the sea levels, it's the acidity in the sea. Yeah. Yeah. There is a huge, uh, yeah. overwhelming evidence that climate change is happening. And don't believe me as a politician, believe the scientists. Yeah. The IPCC had 250 59 scientists from 39 countries. They had 50,000 comments for peer review. It was the most peer-reviewed piece of science in human I think, history. I think so what, don't believe I'm politicians. Sorry, I think what Nigel Lawson... Lawson is confused. Hold on, I think, I, confused. I think that what Nigel Lawson challenged you with was that there'd been no change over the past... 15 years. Yeah, is that true or not? No, there has no. been a, it's been slowing down. It's, it's been, been flat. flat. It's been, no, it's, it's been not flat. flat. It is not flat. It doesn't look, take very much change to see the rise and, and, in sea and, levels and, that no, we're when seeing. When we're talking <laughs> about climate change, we're actually talking about long periods. So if, what, what, what the Global Warming Foundation, which uh, Nigel Lawson uh, chairs, which is trying to undermine the uh, scientific consensus on climate change, they take this 15 years, and because of the climate change, the, in the increase in global uh, temperatures have been uh, slowing down, they say climate change is isn't happening. But when you ask the scientists, they say, well, over a short period of time, we're not, we don't actually expect temperatures always to go up. If you take a longer uh, uh, time period, temperatures are definitely going up. Ed, can so I just ask you... I'm afraid he chooses his periods, and he shouldn't do that. Ed, why, why do you say uh, Nigel Lawson tries to undermine scientific opinion? It, what do you think his motive is when you say uh, you, 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 undermining? You, you, you suggest there's some sort of ulterior motive? Uh, well, he, uh, Nigel will have to, 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 to answer no, you, that. You part. answer. You, you use the no. verb undermine as there's, well, he, there was some sort of malpractice in well, no, disagreeing. Well, what uh, Nigel does continually, he's done it in, you know, he does it in a very open way. He writes a, 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 a good book about it. It's, it's worth a read. I just disagree with uh, most of what's in it. Um, what, what he does, he uh, puts his argument, but he denies, as far as I can see, the evidence from the international scientific community. And it's not just the international scientific community. The current chief scientist of Britain believes there's a problem. The previous chief scientist in Britain thought there was a huge issue here, and his, his predecessor right. did as well. The scientists are uh, telling right. us yeah. we've got to take this yeah. seriously. All right. Now, I'll come back to you, Nigel. Let's just hear from some members of, of, of our audience. You, sir, over there. Right. 
was on the second part of the question, and what are we going to do about it? And what are we going to... And so, so what can we do to reduce the risk of further disasters? Well, I, all, all you've done, Berman, is argue about whether it exists, so getting on to the actual doing something about it is going to be slightly more difficult. Good, good thinking. Paul Kenny. <laughs> oh, oh, interesting. Throw that one to me, yeah. So, uh, can, I, can I say, um, look, I remember... In, uh, just first part. I remember in the 70s the scientists were telling us that the ozone layer was, going to be, was being depleted. I remember it. I remember it really well. And uh, everybody went around changing from hairsprays and getting rid of fridges and all sorts of things. So the idea that this has not been a long, long, long run-in to where we are now, it frankly, is not an honest position. And the acidity of the oceans is rising. It is man-made. Mm. And the polar caps are melting. Now, someone didn't leave the fridge door open. I mean, they're absolutely melting. Mm. Now, that's what the evidence I see. I don't have the scientific knowledge of other colleagues on the panel, but that's what I see. And so what we need to do about it, this is where the argument comes in about how we have to adapt what energy we use, how we use it. And uh, Nikki's dead right. Actually, a lot of the car manufacturers took the decision to move to much lower car emissions really low emissions. We've now seen uh, dual fuel issues. This was because they recognised that this was where the markets were going to be. And that's what we've got to force other people to do. In some senses, it is just good business to lower our carbon emissions. It is good business to actually take the view that there is global warming and adjust our energy use, our types of energy. We've been talking about carbon capture for years. I'm, I'm still waiting to see it. What about, what about adding to fuel bills a bit for green well, we, development of green and other 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 sources of well, uh, we've been, energy. We've, Are you in favour of that? I am actually, but I'm actually more in favour of actually using some of the profits that the energy companies make <laughs> instead of taking out the pockets of the consumers. Right. Let, uh, uh, let, me, let, let me hear from some members of our audience. Um, uh, the person in the blue shirt, right up there on the on the left, first. Uh, yeah, I think they're all valid points that have been raised. Um, I think the scientific data is a, such a small window that we've looked at, given how long the planet has been in existence. Now, I'm not a scientist. I'm a person who works out in the water. And I think the quickest way we can make an impact in our waters is we're an island race and we remind ourselves about stop carrier bags. It's the simplest mm. way forward. There's so many things we can do. All great points raised, yeah. but look at pollution. Stop carrier bags in supermarkets. How, can, how simple can it be? OK. And yeah. you say in the middle there. Yes. I think, I think we're slightly missing the point here. I think if you went to the Philippines and asked the people affected by this and say, you know, what's the single most significant thing we could do to perhaps um, help them survive it, help their family members survive it, they're not going to be saying, you know, carbon tax and, and climate change. They're going to be saying, help me build a house that's yeah. got proper foundations. It's a structural argument as well. So, you know, I think it's a lot more complicated than that. And, uh, and, 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 and a person over there, on the, on the, on the right-hand side. I think the answer to the question, what can we do about it, really doing things like green levees and so on, I think it's just a drop in the ocean when you compare it to uh, parts of Asia and China and so on who are having massive yeah. more impact on, on climate change and CO2 emissions. Yeah, N Nigel Lawson, do you, do, you, do you approve of green levees? Do you approve of...? I, th I, I think the whole policy which uh, Ed Davey uh, is promoting is positively immoral. It's not going to work, fortunately, but it is positively immoral. The gentleman at the uh, halfway the, towards the back there who said that what the Philippines people want is to rebuild their country. They want to get richer because they're a poor country that's been exacerbated by the huge increase in population. It's the fastest growing population in the world. What we need to do, what the developing countries, it's not going to mean agreement. Ed is going to go to Warsaw next week to try and get a global agreement. He's not going to get a global not agreement. Not in Warsaw, no. Not uh, in, in, uh, in Poland. You'll get a Poland. Yeah, but we're not expecting to get an agreement no, next you're not week. going to get an agreement. It's, and you won't get one from 2015. 2015. And, uh, and they didn't get one at the Copenhagen conference. Where but they but what is the positive... And I'll tell you why what it is... What is the immoral. positive immorality? I'll tell you yes. what the positive immorality is. That the, the reason we use in the world, carbon-based energy, fossil fuels. It is because it's far and away the cheapest form of energy uh, now and will be for the foreseeable future. Not forever. Technology is wonderful. Science is wonderful. But for the foreseeable future, it is. And if you, if, if you move away from that, you're moving from cheaper energy to more expensive energy. 
It's causing enough problem in this country. The developing world, China is not going to go by that. Quite right too. And China is very important. The increase in Chinese emissions in one year mm. is bigger mm. than the total emissions from the United Kingdom. So what we do is neither here nor there, unless there is this global agreement. But the Why immorality is Why what? The immorality is this, is that if you are inhibiting their economic development, by uh, forcing them or persuading them to use expensive uh, energy instead of cheaper energy, which they're not going to do, but if you do, then you are going to condemn hundreds of millions of people in China, in India, in the developing world to premature death, unnecessary disease, uh, poverty, unnecessary poverty, uh, and destitution. That is what you are doing right. if you get them to do that. It and, is positively immoral. And, and, it and, is economic growth which will take them off, which will co solve the problems in the Philippines and elsewhere, and that means using the cheapest form of energy So you're, pre you're preventing growth in poorer parts of the world, and that is positively immoral. Well, we're not doing that. What we're saying is the developed world needs to make the biggest cut in carbon emissions, mm. And we need to help, right. and we need to help the developing countries, the poorer countries, get a cleaner form of development than we've had. And if you go to China, let's take China. China is investing more in low carbon technology than any other country in the world. It has woken up to the problems of pollution and climate change, and I'll tell you why. I've just been to China. If you go to their big cities, the air pollution in places like Beijing is dramatic. It's appalling. And the Chinese know... Nothing to do with it, climate change. It, 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 pollution in the air. Nothing whatever to do that, That's not what they think. And what they are doing is they are going to tackle this seriously. They are now talking about building what they call an ecological civilization. They are moving very, very hard and fast on green growth in order to try to change their whole growth model so it doesn't damage uh, the air and the environment and the climate. So uh, you're behind the times, uh, Nigel. If you look at uh, China, you look at other countries, even you look at America. If you look at what Obama is now doing with uh, Secretary Kerry, they are moving fast to try to uh, reduce the carbon emissions from the US. That's why I think we can get a global deal. Right. We desperately need it. And I think we need, uh, we need well. to make sure that it enables our economies to grow and developing countries to right. grow too. Oh, in, in my industry, right. the Chinese are, are working on low emission technology to sell to the yes. rest of the world. Indeed, they are. It yes. is not actually right. happening in the remote villages and townships That's of right. China. The Chinese plan is that by 2020 how much do you think of their energy their electricity will be generated by wind power only five percent that's in their plan the, the, in the solar, in how much do you think in, so, in solar one half of one percent that they they have been building coal fired this is the fossil fuel industry, industry. they've been mm. building coal fired this is not the fossil fuel yes, industry. it is the, you, I you look at take the other back. technology they, you look at the other technology they have been taking uh, keep part they have been they have been <laughs> they have been building yes, my coal fired <laughs> power stations at the rate of pretty well one yeah. a month for several years and they're continuing with that. These are not being built for decoration, they're being built for use. You are and that they're the doing it. No, this is happening. I, I, you've been there taken is, for a there ride. Is a big, there is a big change there's a big change happening. <laughs> there is a big There is a big change happening. Let me give you an example of solar, what is extremely exciting. The costs of solar have plummeted in recent years because China is, is manufacturing solar panels at a massive scale. That is brilliant for uh, villages in sub-Saharan Africa which can't connect to the grid. Mm. They're going to have to have, they're going to have power much cheaper than some of the mm. kerosene fossil fuels that they currently use. Right. They're going to save money and go green and that's going to be brilliant for the education I'm going to stick with this. If health it, of Ed, curb, curb, curb your... Uh, uh, self, yes. I can't curb yourself, can you? No. Just, 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 and don't curb your enthusiasm either. Just pause for a moment. The woman here in the front. Uh, I'm a materials scientist. I've been involved in developing materials that move from CFCs to HFAs, which improve um, carbon... Well, it, it reduces greenhouse um, warming within the atmosphere. Um, and I would say that what we really need to look at, whether we've got warming or not, and I do believe it is happening, 
is that we reduce our need for fossil fuels, mm. yeah. resource mm. efficiency. Nikki will have been developing her car to have mm. low weight, right. light yeah. weighting in her vehicle and, and parts that are efficient. And that's what we should do. We should invest in technology and innovation and Thank do you. that. And that's what China are doing. They're doing it as fast as we are because exactly. they know that is the way to go. Sorry, do, you, do you agree with Nigel on this, or do you, <laughs> where, where, where do you stand? Unusually for me, I find myself agreeing with Ed for a very simple <laughs> principle. We've got scarce resources. Why would we encourage profligate use? Actually, whether you think yeah. climate yeah. change is happening or not, surely being more efficient with what we've got makes good business sense. And as I say, when the evidence is there that it's 95% likely that climate change is man-made, actually, I want to see Britain being leading in this. I want to see Britain leading because of all the jobs that will come yeah. from renewable energies, from all the jobs that will come from that different way of living. Yep. I don't just want Nikki to recycle more. I want her to have a different, more sustainable way of living because it's going to be better for our economy right. and better for Britain. But and I'm sorry, Nigel, you're the one who's confused, who thinks that we can carry on as we are now without there being any consequences. Of course there are consequences. And it's not just the people in the Philippines who will feel it. It's the people on the roads in my community who have to deal with high levels of pollution or the people who don't get the jobs that could come because we're not as efficient, because we're not being able to compete with the Chinese, because they've got those technologies. Right. I would like to hear from one or two more. That's right. But we've got to keep doing that, haven't we? Absolutely. We've got to keep doing that. I can't pretend that nothing is happening as Nigel is. All right, your turn over there. Um, I was going to say, everyone talks about emissions and industry. Farming accounts for an enormous amount of, uh, of greenhouse gases. Sheep in New Zealand. Mm cows in America, I remember learning it in Geography GCSE. Um, and also I think it's incredibly arrogant of human beings to think that there's anything that we can do that will destroy the planet. You know, when the planet's had either hope that, that we do start to make changes fast enough, that we are still here in generations to come. But also, you know, if, we, if it goes too far, the planet's just going to have enough and we'll just say goodbye to us like I, I, it did I can't in the work past. out whether you're for cows and sheep or against. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I don't really have a political stance on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, who hasn't had a go yet? Now, you've spoken before. Up there, th there, you, sir, with the spectacles on, yes. Um, using uh, greater use of renewable energy isn't just the right thing to do as regards climate change. It's also about energy security, mm. Mm. so we're not right. affected by, you know, a new Gulf War cutting off all supplies. Right. And oil, oil prices rose massively um, a few years ago and, and then fell, you know, and, and whereas renewable energy, renewable energy is probably more stable in terms of its cost. Uh, all right, we've got a big audience here. Do any of you... Uh, side with what Nigel Lawson has been saying about uh, climate change. You do, sir, in the centre there, yes. I agree totally. If you think at the moment the ice cap in the Antarctic is as big as it's ever been. That's right. And the planet, since the Big Bang, has been going in and out of cold, <laughs> hot, wet, dry. It does what it does. We're not we're the not dinosaurs, sir. Do we want to be extinct? We surely? Don't. We've got no choice. <laughs> if we want to be extinct, we'll be extinct. If the planet or the we'll sun or whoever choice. takes it, it will do what it does, and we will have no influence. So you would take no action on any front? No, I think it's, all those things that you talk about are great. What we're doing is we're confusing the bigger issue. We can't affect the climate. We can't affect the change. Cleaning up the air is a great idea. We Renewables can. are a great idea. None of that's wrong. It's just that, it's, as the lady pointed out, it's arrogant to think that we can actually do anything to change all the right. world. If All the right. science is telling us, though, that there's a good possibility that we are responsible, so we could do things that would limit that damage, isn't it the right thing to do? Look at what we can do to do that. It's not just good business, but it's also that 95% risk ratio. Isn't it a good idea? The that risk if it of is, what? Because if the science is telling the us that we, are, that we are 95% yeah. likely that man, -made man, man is responsible for climate change, so ergo, we can do something about it, why would we not? And, and who's a coastal city? We're a coastal city here in Portsmouth. Here in Portsmouth. It's a right. flat coastal city. It Why risk the city? Uh, all right. Well, our hour is up. We started with Portsmouth. We come back to Portsmouth. Thank you very much. Um, that's all for question time this week. Next week, we're going to be in Salford in Greater Manchester. We've got a rather different kind of audience uh, from normal. We're looking for people who are either under 30 or over 60 because we want to see how two different generations view the big issues, the economy the deficit, welfare, housing, anything else that comes up in the news next week. So uh, we've got on the panel, um, at the moment, the Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, and the broadcaster, uh, Joan Bakewell. Um, 
so that's next week in Salford. The week after that, we're in Scotland in Falkirk, and that's the week the Scottish Government is going to publish its detailed case for independence. So if you want to come to Salford and you are the right side of 30 or 60, whatever the right side means, um, or if you're any age and want to come to Falkirk, uh, apply via our website or call the telephone number that's on the screen there, 033-0123-9988. If you've been listening to this on BBC Radio 5 Live, the debate continues, as you know, but from all of us here in Portsmouth, my thanks to our panel and to all of you who came here from Question Time. Good night. The political discussion continues for us next, this week. And David Dimbleby has a new series starting this weekend on BBC One, a taster of what he's been diving into coming up. <laughs>